Ah, uh, just remember who you are. Always remember who you are. That that deep essence that is you that lives within you that is unstruck by anything or anyone, any event. It's beyond the surface. It's way past the superficial layer of this external self. It's that part of you that is unaffected and connected to everything that you are. Welcome my guest, Rosie Acosta. She is an inspirational speaker, yoga and meditation teacher, yoga teacher trainer, and a holistic health coach. She has studied yoga and mindfulness for more than 20 years and has taught for over a decade. She is the host of the very popular weekly conversational wellness podcast, Radically Loved. Being a sought after advisor, coach, yoga and meditation teacher, she travels the world leading workshops, retreats, and trainings boosting a private clientele that includes Olympic athletes, NFL champions, NBA all-stars, and veterans of the war. She has been featured in Yoga's Journal, Well and Good, Forbes, and the New York Post. And today we introduce her newest book, You Are Radically Loved, A Healing Journey to Self-Love. Well, welcome to the show, Rosie. I'm so happy to have you on Passion Love Pursuit podcast and that we made this work. I know we were kind of like grappling with the timing and everything, but I'm just so honored to have you on. This is I'm so honored to be here. This is so much fun. I'm excited. Thank you. Well, today is actually your launch day of your book, which is like birthing a baby. So I recognize that and I want to celebrate you and celebrate the birth of your book radically or sorry let me get the title right it's radically or how <laughs> let me step back uh you are radically loved yes i got it okay <laughs> i just want to celebrate that that's such a big big accomplishment so congrats thank you so much yeah it definitely is a very interesting type of birth so thank you for also acknowledging that because it is right Yes. Uh, I, I can't even imagine I haven't birthed a baby, baby book yet, but I know it's on the forefront of something I want to accomplish in my lifetime, a, a few of them. And I'm sure you've had this book in the works for a long time. So let's just, I didn't think that we would start there, but since we're on the topic, at this birth of a baby book, <laughs> how, yeah, long like- is the, how long has the journey been unfolding? Yeah. So it started, uh, I, I had the idea for it back when I started Radically Loved, my my website. I was doing, I was blogging a lot. I had a former blog called Organic Mexican Girl where I transformed my grandma's Hispanic Mexican uh, recipes into like vegan treats. And so I was doing that for a long time and I just really have always loved writing. I mean, I wrote my first book when I was in kindergarten like at the it wasn't I mean don't worry I'm not like a prodigy or anything it was just everybody in my class did it It, we we were given prompts by our teacher and we just wrote them out and at the end she consolidated them all together and created these little books for us so ever Mm. since then I always had this internal desire to do it one day and it's funny, Erica, that you're asking that because I was thinking about it this morning. It's a Tuesday. It's two twenty two twenty two, and one of my friends is like, "Doesn't it? How does it feel?" And I'm like, "It just feels like Tuesday. Like it doesn't feel like any other. It feels like every other day." But I know energetically that something that I have been working on for like over a decade is out in the world now. The actual book writing process, well if I want to get technical and I think you might enjoy getting really technical, I'm totally happy to go into exactly how it worked. So back in 2012, I started my new website radically loved and I started to conceptualize a table of contents. Uh, I recorded this podcast. I can't remember exactly what episode number is, but maybe 
I'll give you, I'll give it to you. You can put in the show notes or something, but I do talk about exactly how it went from the conception to getting a book proposal written to getting to an agent to getting rejected 32 times to finally getting a, a, a book deal in 2020, March of 2020 of all times. Exactly. Um, it, when the pandemic hit us. Exactly. Right when well. I was like, listen, I've been working on this for so long. I don't even care. Like I'll self-publish it if a publisher doesn't want it. And it ended up working. So it took about a year and a half to write. Um, and that includes like revisions and back and forth. And I, I don't think normally it would have taken that long, but given the pandemic and the state of the world, I think it took that long because of everything that was going on. And honestly, if it hadn't been for the pandemic, I don't know that I would have had the time to do it. I wouldn't have, I would have never made the time to write it. So it all kind of just flowed into what, what it turned into, what it's, what it's now become 12 chapters of radical support. Oh, it's so amazing. And you know, it's a, probably so true is so many people birthed books because of the pandemic, because they were given yes. the time they usually don't get. And also probably the clear mental space to actually write down something yeah. from their head. <laughs> so Did you get any, any creative hits during that time? Absolutely. I mean, I got clarity of where I want to head, which has been a battle for me to figure out my purpose, passion, like my true deep seated purpose and passion did birth through the pandemic because I did a lot of personal growth. And of course, the one thing I always lacked with the job and everything and the podcast is time. Time is the greatest asset we have. So we were given this blessing of time that we were able to get like clear space in our head, which we'll go into partly what that looks like, which is so key to really yeah. getting those downloads and that creative inspiration is by creating space in time. Yeah. So, and so many of us blessing for the that. pandemic. Yes. Yeah. Which we'll go into that. So, um, I actually, uh, I found out you're really good friend of mutual friend of mine, Amberly Lago. And I know we're dear lovers of Amber, Amberly yes. Lago. So I want to throw out her name because shout she out. also, yeah, shout out to our mutual friend, Amberly Lago. She also has a podcast to grit and grace. And then your podcast is radically love. So everybody, of course, go, go, go check them all out. And, uh, so I want to go into your book, of course, everything that that entails and how that even came about in your lifetime to even birth this type of book. But most importantly, I want people that don't know you to know your story because you do come from quite, a uh, very, what's the word you colorful could in the world. Yeah. That's a great, I love that very colorful background and journey to get you where you are today. And it's, it's quite transformative. So I, I grew up in Los Angeles, so we have that common Aldi. So I would love it if you could share your story and in, in your journey that really where everything's where, from. whereabouts did you grow up? I grew up in Palos Verdes. So oh, I, I grew up, up on, I grew up up on the hill, but I know very much down from the hill, if you want to say, I, I remember having this conversation with somebody that lived in uh, Harbor City, and he also grew up around gangs and, and this troubled neighborhood, if you want to yeah. say, and he was yeah. literally, you know, very close to me. So I very much understand the dynamic of LA and I've always worked near downtown LA. So yeah, I, I yeah, know. no, it's, familiar. it changes right from grid to grid, from block to block. It, it's so bizarre now to look at the real estate and see some of the places where I was around or my family lived that's now like million dollar homes. It's insane. I'm like, oh my God, you didn't walk these Silver okay. Lake Echo Park guys. Like this was not a safe I mean. environment. And now people, I mean, there's, it's total hipsterville, which is amazing. I think it's so great. Um, yeah, I grew up in East LA area when, you know, my, I was a child. My parents moved around a little bit. We we're in different parts of East LA and we finally landed in this cute, cute, I'm like cute. Everything's cute to me. I'm like this cute little housing project that was, uh, over time overrun by, by gangs. And so it was a very tumultuous, uh, 
chaotic environment. Uh, my childhood was nice, you know, but as I got older and as all the disenfranchised youth unsupervised also got older, the more uh, it started to become a troubled environment. So I struggled a lot with um, PTSD and what made it so mundane was the fact that everybody was struggling with the same type of upbringing. So it wasn't noteworthy that you were growing up in an environment where you would routinely have drive-by shootings and gang violence and, you know, just experience really traumatic things that children shouldn't necessarily have to grow up around. Um, that really led me to turning into a teenager and, and creating a, a very uh, rebellious experience. I was suffering from debilitating panic attacks and agoraphobia because I was traumatized and my parents couldn't figure out what my problem was. They couldn't figure out why I would get these bouts of not wanting to leave the house and being hysterical because I was afraid. And then when I would leave my house, get to school and be absolutely terrified of leaving and going home. And when you think about it as an outsider, of course, this 13 year old is having debilitating panic attacks and agoraphobia because there's constant violence going on everywhere. She's afraid that she's going to get shot or killed or jumped or something. So I was introduced to meditation um, via a friend of my mom's who had given her these pamphlets from the Self-Realization Fellowship. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Self-Realization Fellowship, but it's a organization that was founded by Paramahansa Yogananda. He wrote this famous book called Autobiography of a Yogi. And there are different centers all over LA, all over the world. Um, he came to the West back in the 30s and started to teach influential people, so people in Hollywood, to try and bring these Eastern practices to, to the West. And so this was a center that was located across from where my mom worked. Um, she, these pamphlets were basically talking about how meditation helps stress and yoga is really good for the body. Just, you know, these little pamphlets of yogic philosophy. And I was really into new agey accoutrements at the time. So this just seemed like a cool thing to get into. And it really spoke to me. I was disenfranchised from Catholicism because I'd had a not awesome experience when I was doing my catechism classes, which I, I write about in the book. And I, I was just going through a lot. I was getting in trouble with the law and I was getting faced with almost going to jail. And so I, I just, I was asking for help without knowing I was asking for help. So when I finally opened those pamphlets up, I decided that I needed to go and check this place out. And fortunately I, I did. I, I always laugh because I tell people how I ditched school to go think like I couldn't think at school. School gave me anxiety. So um, I would ditch because I needed a, a day to myself. I needed some self care time, you know? So I did that and I found like the center and, and I walked in and everybody was so nice and everybody looked so zened out and calm and loving. And I thought it was weird because yogis are weird. I thought it was culty, but I was compelled anyway. And I ended up walking into this lecture given by this um, sannyasin, this, this teacher and she was talking about how we're responsible for our own happiness, guided us through a meditation, and for the first time in my life felt what my body was and felt my breath and was able to really take my first deep exhale. And and that was it. That was the only opening I ever needed to getting to to see that I had a body, that I was present, that I was awake and it opened the door for this diving in of all Eastern philosophies, learning about Buddhism, learning about yoga, learning about Vedic texts, 
you know, even learning about Christianity, like I just went deep into the world of spirituality and, and I'm so grateful for it because it really helped pave my path and it created a, a deep anchor, I think, in my journey to, to self-healing. Wow. So there, it's so beautiful because it seems like it kind of naturally unfolded. It wasn't like there was, um, well, actually, let me ask you this. Cause you did kind of skip over. You almost got arrested. Oh. And I know this is part of your story. Um, cause I imagine if, if I already like just hearing your story, I imagine you were in fight or flight all the time. Like that was your mode. That was like your, as you said, that was your mundane mode. And I imagine the only way you could recognize that is, is if you have this moment kind of like where you could peel back and see yourself from a different perspective. And so I'm kind of curious when you, was there like a catalyst moment that realized like, this is not normal to be in this state? Yeah, I think, I think I always knew it wasn't normal. Being in a hypervigilant state is really taxing and I had insomnia, like I wouldn't sleep well. I, I was always getting in trouble at school when I was a child because I'd always fall asleep in school because I couldn't sleep at night. And I don't know that I ever felt, it felt the sort of like, it was definitely normalized where it felt like, okay, this is just what everybody goes through. But there was a deep knowing within me that just knew that this was not the way. It just didn't feel right to me. And I, I really can't explain exactly what that comes from, but I, I akin it to that resonance that we all have when we know we want to create a certain type of life or we know when things aren't in alignment, when we know we're not on the right path or we know we don't have the right career or even the right partner. There's just this deep knowing that there's just no question of it. And so I recognized that from a young, young age that there was just something amiss in the world. And it, it almost felt like I knew it wouldn't last forever, but I knew that I had to live through it, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And, it, and that's so true. I think we all have that inner knowing. It's just learning to connect with it. And that's what we'll go deeper into because that's really what it's about is how do we actually connect to it? And what do we do? What are the steps to get to that, that intuition, that inner knowing? So we'll go into that. But I do want to also say, as it's been told many times, our environment creates our reality. Who we surround ourselves is who we become. And the only way to change that is by changing our surroundings and our environment. So somebody that feels, if you could speak to the people that feel they're in a certain environment that is not supporting their growth, that let's say they are in a toxic environment, and that could be anything from your family to your relationship, to your friends um, or peers or whatnot. So how does somebody break free of that environment they're in if they don't have the resources, let's say, yeah. like what's the steps to begin to get out of that? Yeah, that's such a great question and one that I, I actually get asked often because so many people are in a position where maybe they can't change their environment, maybe they lack the resources or they're feeling like they're stuck. Maybe they have a partner and they share children and, and it's a very real uh, experience. We have an internal environment that we control. So I always like to start with what I can change. And that internal environment can create your external experience. So if I can't necessarily move out of this na dangerous neighborhood right now that I'm living in, I can change my internal experience. Now, one thing that I will say is if you have a deep rooted fear of danger and, or you don't have food to eat, it's going to be really hard for you to embark on a spiritual quest. That's probably not at the top of your list. And I know this because I know so many people that are in that position and I myself have been in that position. So the first thing to do is to establish a sense of safety. So if you don't feel safe in your environment, there has to be a, there has to be a creative way to work around it, you know, 
the first thing I will say is work on creating that safety environment within yourself. Do you feel safe within yourself? Are you able to care for yourself? Do you nourish yourself? Are you able to inquire probing questions to yourself? Are you able to give yourself the time and space that you need in order to heal? And can you find somebody in your life that can support you? Maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a mentor, maybe it's somebody outside in your community that can help support your desire to, to grow, to heal. It really does, I do believe that it really does take a village to heal, just like it takes a village to raise a child, right? I think it takes a village to create a healing space. You know, back in the in the tribal times, you know, I come from a, a I'm first gen Mexican American. My grandmother is Peruvian descent. So she comes from this like lineage of midwives and and um, healing women and this belief that we heal in circles, we heal in communities and always embedded in us that we need to create that community. It's important to create a circle of people that support you and love you unconditionally. And unfortunately, we're in a time in 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 our life currently, culturally, so so uh, societally, where it can be difficult to create those types of circles, um, but it's not impossible. And maybe it doesn't look perfect. Maybe the person that you're maybe is, is supporting you isn't supporting you exactly the way you want to. So I, I will ask that person, those people that are looking for that support to be open, to accept people as they are so that they can fully accept you as you are. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that those are really the main key elements to starting your spiritual path. Beautiful, beautifully said. And I think some people possibly don't have their environment yet, like people to reach out to, because I think some people just feel alone. And especially yes. with the pandemic, I oh. think that was definitely heightened. So it, it is. And the, the great thing about the online space or this virtual space is you could easily connect with people online. Like if you, I've said this before in a podcast, if you admire somebody, just DM them and say, I just want to tell you your videos really inspire me. And that's a way to kind of cultivate possibly a new tribe, if you want to say, is, is just by being open and honest and, and complimentary. If something resonates with you, speak it. I think that's a beautiful way to start cultivating at least some relationships. Yeah. Yeah, I think so many people online just want the validation for themselves, but they they're so quick to dismiss the people on the other side that give them that validation. You know, I, I always say I was having this conversation not that long ago with an uh, influencer friend of mine where she was telling me how overwhelmed she was with uh, getting these DMs from people. And she's got a, you know, she's got like over a million followers and it's a full, full time job. She's constantly answering uh, messages. And sometimes she's just like, I just can't answer every single one. And, and I think it's great the effort that she puts in any way to try and respond to everybody. But there was a moment in time where she was, she just decided she didn't want to respond to people. And I'm like, that's okay. You know, sometimes we need a break, we need some space. But, but then she got really used to not responding. And I'm like, how do you expect people to support you if if you're not showing up at all for them like pe everybody needs acknowledgement right like everybody needs to Connection feel seen yes. right yeah yeah everyone wants to be seen heard and understood that's what we're all doing here so i totally agree with what you're saying er erica about like reaching out and telling people uh, watching that video made made a difference in my day or listening to that podcast episode really created uh, anchoring sense within myself or whatever it may be. I think, you know, I, I still do it. I, I like to respond to my people. I've, I've got a pretty good relationship. Like I have so many relationships with people I've never met, That's you awesome. know, I'm sure you have the same yeah. where, Absolutely. you know, it was really nice actually for me during the pandemic, because for so many years, people had asked me to teach online, to do virtual classes. And I just resisted because I'm mm. like an in-person person. I want to be in-person. I want to touch sweaty palms. I want to 
adjust sweaty bodies. Like I want to be in the presence of another human. So I resisted it for so, so long. And we were all obviously forced to go into the virtual space. And then once I was there, I realized, wow, there's so many people that follow me or listen to my podcast that just want to take class with me. And now I get to Amazing. see them. And it was just, oh, so eye opening. And I got addicted to it. And then, then I went over extreme on it. And then I had to take a break, you know, but, yeah. but that, that is a beautiful experience because at the end of the day, like we're all just, we're all just trying to live our best life, right? Yeah, exactly. And also, if you really look at it, and today, 2222, it's all about like manifestation, let's say. And if you want to be supported, if you want to be loved, if you want to be seen, if you want to be heard, which everybody does, right? You need to give love. You need to be, you know, recognize that you see others like that you hear other, you need to embody that first to receive yeah. it. So that's yeah. kind of like, you know, give and take, give and take. It's all about like yeah. cause and effect, right? Yeah. So that's super important. Um, and another thing, speaking of uh, change, very much people get tied to their identity. And I imagine your identity, if you were to look back, I assume you would think that you are this you know, uh, Mexican, you know, uh, that you're, you grew up in this family and this was your identity. This is who you were. And then it, it's hard to move from that. So how do you recommend somebody could start to transform this identity and not be so rigid and tied to, Oh, I'm, I came from this. This is, this is who I am. Yeah. I mean, that's a great, well, I mean, yoga is really what, what uh, undoes that sense of, mm -hmm self. So yoga means union. It means the unification of mind, body, and spirit. And the whole foundation behind the practice is that we begin to dissolve those, that sense of self, the small S self, right? The small S self being your identity, your personality, your horoscope, and so on. The big S self is your essence. It's the nameless. It's the thing that you are at your core, your soul essence. Purusha, right? So it's Purusha and Prakti. Prak Prakriti is the... Actually, no, I messed that up. So we'll have to like edit that out. I'm like, I don't want to give <laughs> people good. the wrong information. <laughs> um, the Purusha is the soul it's the the essence of that deep collective thread that binds us all together it's 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 our soul it's who we are and i think that yeah the idea is to peel away our identity and and get to this state of non self recognition and be super enlightened beings. But unfortunately, that's hard because we have a mind that is just constantly uh, vying for our attention and wants to self identify with this being this body, this career, this creation. So it makes it really hard for us to go into the state of non recognition of oneness, right? So there's this dualistic mentality and non-dualistic non -dualistic mentality. So the dualistic mentality is I'm separate from you. I'm, I have this, I'm Rosie. I'm a cancer. I am X, Y, and Z. I'm, I'm a first gen Mexican American. I grew up in this environment, whatever. The non-dualist perspective is we're all one and that's it. Like, I am you, you are me, we are everything, God is all of us. So, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard, right? Because for me, I think moving on in my life and pulling myself outside of that environment, I, I didn't really identify with that younger version of myself until many, many years later, probably until I was in my late 20s, early 30s. It wasn't even something that I, I thought about and not because I was ashamed or anything. It's just, I didn't find it to be noteworthy because I felt like that's just how I grew up. There was nothing very substantial about it. Like 
to me at the time it was very much like okay identify with what your story is but don't set up camp there it's part of who i am yes i'm proud of where i came from i i'm grateful for my experiences but that's not my entire identity that's not who i am so if i were to ask you erica or anybody out there listening like who are you so like who who are you you know yeah and a lot of people will say their career and what their they career. do That's right. and everything but if, if i were to say i am a light i am i am love i am abundant i you know i would i would list off all those things that i know i am at the deepest part of my soul like i am as a soul not as this human doing all these things so that's what, how i would respond now but it took time to get there <laughs> yeah yeah no but that's that but that's the healing journey right that's the journey to arriving at your spiritual quest your foundational core of of who you are and and yeah, it takes time and it's, we're constantly learning Change is inevitable. And some days it's really beautiful to be in that abundant state of non self recognition and other times it's really hard because you're really identified with how is this book going to do? Like, are people going to enjoy it? Are people going to leave good reviews or, you know, people going to burn it, you know, whatever it may be. <laughs> You know, it's and I, I there was one line that you had in the book that I really loved that your mind uh, cannot, you know, you can't stop your mind, but you could redirect it. And I think that's what's so beautiful is that in the practice of yoga or meditation is your uh, you are able to redirect your mind by doing certain practices and being still and creating that space. I think that's so beautiful to look at it because our mind always wants to keep us safe. And we have to train it to look for the good, to notice the good and everything. And actually, that's one of my questions that I was going to ask you is, how does somebody go from a negative mindset to abundant mindset, meaning lack to gratitude? Like, what would you, uh, I know you mentioned, obviously, yoga is a really good way, but how does somebody, because anybody that's struggling, it's so easy to get in that victimhood and to just yes. circle around the negativity. It's just, again, our, our brain is meant to keep us safe. So we, we kind of like, how could we protect ourselves and keep ourselves safe? Yeah. But um, yeah, our I, mind was, yeah. was not it like the mind's not created for finding happiness. It's, it's created for survival. That's the nature of the mind. So I mean, it's such a great, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on this. It, I, I love following these accounts on Instagram that say, oh, this is how to quickly turn your, your mind from lack to abundance, just simply by using gratitude as, uh, as an exercise, but it's really hard, right? It's, it's a hard thing to do if you're feeling some type of way. I think first and foremost is allow yourself to feel sorry for yourself for however long you need. Uh, I would say a couple of hours for me, I I've given myself up to a day mm. of today is complaint day and I voice it out and I tell Tori, my partner of 18 years, I say today is a complaint day, complaining day. So everything there's, you know, how come you didn't tell me that we ran out of blueberries? I really wanted blueberries. Yeah. Like, okay. So today's going to be a complaining day. And I just know. And and typically once I say it out loud, it's not an entire day, right? It's like maybe a couple of things. And then I think it's hilarious. And I'm like, oh God, like after a couple hours, you should try it. After a couple of hours, it's hard to find so many things to complain about unless it's the same thing over and over that I'm dwelling on. You know, I usually give myself the space of a day. And after that, it's like I get it out of my system. And it's gone. And usually by the following day, I'm like, great, let's move, let's move on because I'm, I'm a very much about, I'm, I'm not going to let people or situations live rent free in my brain. I've got too many things going on in there that like, this is not allowed to live there. So I, I'm very good. People know this about me that I'm like very good at boundaries. I'm a very good boundary person. I have great boundaries with people. I have great boundaries with my family. I have great boundaries with myself for myself and and all in the name of self-care and self-love because I think that is one of the most important practices that we can do. Now, 
with giving you some practical ways to do that. So that's the first I would say is give yourself the, a time. I would set a time, allocate a specific time of complaining. Like you give yourself a day, give yourself six hours or whatever. Let yourself feel sorry for yourself. Don't let anybody make you or try and placate your emotions. Let yourself have a moment of being upset. It's totally fine. The other tip I would recommend is writing it down and then burning it up. So I like this technique. One of my um, teachers taught me this technique. It's called the Pew 12. Mm. And you basically spew all of everything that's in rattling around in your brain. You set a timer for 12 minutes and you just write, man. You just write stream of consciousness, everything that's happening. And it could be, could be stuff from your childhood. I mean, just whatever it really is that's upsetting you. You're feeling lack. You're feeling like everybody else seems like they're succeeding except you. You're feeling like this person just got engaged or this person's now pregnant or this person just got a New York Times bestselling author book. You know, all of these things. You just write it all down, everything for 12 minutes and then you burn it. Like just watch that thing burn. And you can do a little prayer if you want. And then once it's gone, it's gone. Then you come back and you write down three things you're grateful for. You start to really think about the things in your life. Maybe the fact that you have good health, that you have a place, a roof over your head, regardless of whatever critique might come in from your brain of where you live or maybe wanting a different location. That's the problem. Instead of saying, I'm so grateful for my home, we go into... Uh, I just wish that I was in a better place or um, I need to paint the colors on the wall or like um, maybe it would be better if we go straight into that. So just allow yourself to be grateful for where you are, even if it's just this moment, this breath, like we're not going to be here forever. You know, I'm, I'm kind of a morbid thinker when it comes to shifting your mentality from lack to abundance. I, I always remember there is a silent constant clock ticking in the background that is your life and we don't give it as much attention as we should I think so in those moments for me I remember and sometimes having the remembrance of my own mortality really puts things into perspective quickly yeah right? they say it's death is the greatest teacher because exactly if, if you and some people say meditate on your death and it sounds like you said so morbid but if you're able to understand that if you only have one life to live, and I, I think of, cause I recently had the passing of my dog. I, uh, that's given me that perspective is like, oh my goodness, time is just so, so valuable, so precious. And, I, and we all know that in the back of our mind, we know that, but are we actually living that in that moment day by day and being able to appreciate the moment? I love that you share. And I, I didn't really think about this one, but it goes to, we, we need to feel all feelings, like allow ourselves to feel the feelings, fully feel it so they could dissolve and so that we could release it from our body, like shake it off, you know? And I've been learning this from a lot of mentors lately that we, we need to be able to express, to release every emotion from our body. Otherwise it will store in our body and then create more uh, resistance and more trauma and more you know, negative emotions. So I love that you say, write it out or, or let yourself just process it, let it go yeah. and then be, and then you have more free space to yeah. put in the gratitude. Yeah. What is not expressed is depressed. There you go. So yeah. if we're able to process those feelings, release them, give them out to bury them in the dirt, burn them in the fire, you know, like whatever it is, whatever process, whatever ritual you want to create around it, let it live outside of your body and not inside. That'll really create a good ground for healing. So beautiful. Yes, I, I completely be, believe in that. So let's talk about radical love. I love, okay, I love everything self-love, but there's one thing I've actually leaned personally more into is self-acceptance because that kind of wraps up everything with self-love is truly getting to point that we fully accept ourselves, the totality of who we are, the good, the bad, the failures, you know, the wins, whatever, just the totality of everything. And that when you fully accept yourself, it, it cultivates this love for yourself. But asking from your perspective, what does radical love stand for you? And, and what is this 
encompass for you? God, this is like a loaded question. No, but it's <laughs> such a great question. And, and I've been asked that often in the last couple of weeks. Yes. And I say, I've said this in every interview I've done. I, I try to answer it differently every time when they're like, what is radical love? So I, I answer it differently because I feel like there, it means so many different things and it, it can be in what my invitation is always to the reader or people who listen to my podcast or any of my students is to create a definition for what radical love means to you. Um, for me, radical love is the all pervading force within us, around us, that is the constant shepherd in our experience. It's the guiding light. It's the inner voice. It is the pervading energy that steps in when you feel like there is nothing and no one. And if you've never had the experience of being guided, maybe use this as an opportunity or an experience like that you're here listening to this is not by chance. There's a reason why you're here. Um, and I'm very torn with the whole, there's a reason why everything happens and not so, and I've, I've talked about this a lot. Um, I believe it and then I don't believe it, right? I, I think that w we're all just students. We're all just passengers on this ride and if we can anchor into a deep sense of radical love, then everything else in life is a learning moment and an experience. So today that's what radical love means to me. That's beautiful. <laughs> I, love, I love that. And your book breaks up into, you said 12 chapters. And I know the some of the chapters, for example, is radical, radical resilience, radical so being radically supported and there's so many chapters and that's what I feel like self-love is, is this, uh, this combination of so, so much. And then in your book, it kind of shows you examples of what this looks like and how to actually put it in practice. So if I were to pull out one, uh, I think you said, if I remember, let me think you, when you talked about resilience, you said that happiness is Again, if I'm chopping this up, I'm sorry, but happiness is directly driven by resilience. Am I kind of <laughs> no? I love that everything. However, you took it is perfect. Do you see what I'm saying? It's like however you you took that in. I always love to hear people how how they receive some of the stuff that's written down. You know, sometimes you'll go back and you'll read a book and. If somebody's like, "Well, what was that book about?" or "What was that passage?" and you might be like, "Uh, it was something about like." the salt when it's dispersed isn't so tart or something when it's like in actuality it's the story of the monk who brought its disciple <laughs> down to the lake and had them taste a gulp of of the water once the salt was dissipated with the moral of the story being once it's dissipated it's not going to be as strong right so it's mm -hmm. talking about in terms of our emotions and feelings right but but do you see what I'm saying? So it's always so fun to hear people like the correlation between resilience and happiness, I think comes from our ability to accept what is, to recognize that to be human is to be resilient. We are built to withstand life's changes and challenges. And when we can anchor into that, we can recognize our capabilities, our creativity, and ultimately anchor within ourselves the path for our life and what we're here to do, right? So it establishes that corridor to purpose and happiness. I mean, what what is happiness is so, I talk about that, right? That's kind of how, that's how the chapter starts. It's mm -hmm inquiring what happiness is and how sometimes it's very elusive for a lot of us. And, you know, these are bursts, these are moments, these are bursts of moments in our lives. And of course we want to create a more happy life, but 
the Yoga Sutras, which is a philosophical yogic text that we study as yogis uh, and, and that I teach anytime I've done a yoga teacher trainings, like I teach people how to become teachers. The whole purpose behind the Yoga Sutras is to create more sustainable joy. I mean, that's why we become yogis is to create more of the sustainable joy. And I'm not saying constant joy, constant state of happiness, because it's not real. It's not, we, we go through, a, you know, he, yeah. Healing doesn't move in a straight line. It's constantly moving in different cycles, just like waves in the ocean. So if we're able to recognize that and give ourselves the time and the space and the compassion, I think we can get to a state of sustainable joy. I think we can get to a state of feeling uh, more of a, a sort of sustainable, connected existence. It's a beautiful way to put it. And actually, I mean, I think self-love in general, it's a journey. It's not, it's an ever, ever evolving journey that we will live through as long as we're on this planet, <laughs> you know, it's, it's ebbs and flows challenges. Yes. I mean, I, I talk, you know, I, um, have been doing pretty well. And then when my dog passed, which I knew was going to so be the sorry hard for your loss though. I mean, it, it's so hard. It's so hard. And I knew it was going to be one of the hardest things I would ever experience. And it has been, and it's definitely been the most challenging thing. So I know, you know, my light was dim. I definitely feel like I have to regain the sense of self because he was my companion for so long. So it's life will constantly throw you challenges, but the resilience is that constant practice of knowing we are able to get up, that we are stronger than we think we are way more capable than we can ever imagine. It's we're, we're quite amazing. <laughs> we can yeah. amaze ourselves of how we could think the one thing could break us so badly. Yes. And I don't know if you've experienced any suicidal thoughts in your past. I personally have probably a lot of people listening have. It's uh, honestly a very common things, thing these days. And it's really sad that that's the truth, but showing yourself the proof that you have overcome something in the past is just your evidence that you will overcome something that is going to come inevitably in the future that will be challenging. So I think it's just a journey. It's a practice. It's ever evolving. And that's, I guess, touching on that is self-care is a practice of self-love. So I'm curious, what are some of your ways? And I obviously there's obvious ways you do it, but what are your, what are some of your self-care practices and what would you recommend that someone should start begin to implementing into their life to practice that self-care. Cause I think when people think self-love, self-care, you know, I got this, <laughs> but it's yeah. not, it's not necessarily all. And, uh, you know, I've had other podcasters share this. It's not about the bubble baths and everything. That's great. That's one practice, right? But there's so much more than that. Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to acknowledge and, and again, express my condolences to what was your pup's name? Chance. <laughs> Chance. Oh my goodness. Yeah, bless. he's a, a blue nose pit bull. And he actually has, get this, he has a children's book out on him. And this was, uh, this Christmas was the second year, his book that he stars in Chance of Blue Nose Reindeer. And he actually, we had to say goodbye to him on Christmas. How ironic is that? Wow. It's just like so surreal, but yes, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, I just, you know, I'm, I, I'm like a dog mom and I've been through it and, and I unfortunately have been through this similar experience more times than mm -hmm. I would have liked. Um, but I just, you know, fear, the fear and the, the feeling of loss is it, it comes in waves, right? It, but to me, the way I see it is like the love that you have for him is eternal and you can always anchor into that, right? That love is always going to be there forever. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. I, I love that so much. Um, my book is actually dedicated to my two Shih Tzus that passed away actually. Oh, during... I didn't know that. Oh my yeah. gosh. Oh my gosh. <sighs> so, uh, animals, I love them. I'm like, that's when people ask me, how do you know that God exists? I'm like, because 
she invented dogs. So <laughs> like true. this is Gosh. this is how I know. The greatest know? love. I think it's the greatest love, the greatest teacher. It teaches you so so much. It teaches you really unconditional love. Yes, absolutely. Like that's the, it's pinnacle. Profound. Yeah, it is. It is. It's so um, I'm incredibly just grateful every day that I get to live in a world where there's animals like. OK, um, back to your question. Um, my my best way to practice self-care is saying no. Mm. That's my favorite. I'm a like I said in the beginning, I'm big on boundaries. I'm a boundaries person and that's how I practice self-care. And that's my number one way. And I would advise if you've never done it before, please try it. It's awesome. It feels great. No is a complete sentence. And you don't have to explain yourself. I would try it a couple of times when somebody invites you to do something that you really want to do, but you know that it's going to mess things up or it's going to mess up your sleep schedule or whatever. I'm not saying do it all the time, but I'm saying when you know, if you know you're the type of person that's a people pleaser, like I am. I'm very easily persuaded. I'm a people pleaser. So especially those types of people, it's so important to maintain those boundaries. Um, I'm obviously big on meditation and moving my body. You know, sometimes I get more into running and that substitutes my yoga asana practice. And sometimes it's the other way around. Lately, I've, I'm really geeking out on sleep and learning about sleep and doing yoga nidra yoga nidra is yoga it's a yogic sleep type of meditation not even meditation it's it's a different type of a spiritual practice nidra means sleep and the way that you practice yoga nidra is essentially if you've ever done yoga it's like shavasana the entire time you're being guided with um revolving your conscious consciousness and awareness to different parts of the body to achieve an ultimate state of relaxation. So it's really good for people that have had PTSD or people that have chronic illness as a way to get the body into a state of rest, homeostasis, uh, therefore enhancing your recovery, which is amazing. So that's been a, a big self-care practice the last couple of, well, I would say the last couple of years, but in the last probably two years since the pandemic. I've, I've been trying to focus more and more on that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that for everybody, it, it's going to look different. And I think the biggest advice that I could give any uh, unsolicited advice, if I can give everybody is to create your own practice, create your own self-care routine and, and let it be what it is. And don't, don't beat yourself up over it, you know? Yeah, it is unique to everybody. You have to find what you love and what makes you feel good. It's like yours could feel good for you, but maybe not for another. I know um, I had a hard time doing this. Uh, I always forget how to pronounce Shabasna. Is that how you say it? Okay, I said it right. Yeah, you said it right. <laughs> I, yeah, when I used to do yoga, I literally was that person that at, as that came, I'm like, I got to go. <laughs> And that was literally, when I look at that now, it's proofs to me how I am, I have a problem just being opposed to doing, and I've had to learn this. It's taken me time to learn that, but I, that was my proof. Like I had to be constantly doing, oh, so bad, so bad. <laughs> so it's so important to uh, be able to practice these things like getting enough sleep, noticing if you are not feeling good, like you're not rested, drinking water, whatever it may be, just like find your, your thing that makes you feel that you're nourished in mentally, physically, spiritually. Yeah. I love that. I love everything you said. No, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So, uh, and that's the other thing, like a lot of people, when, um, a lot of people go into this I'll be happy when syndrome. I wanted to bring this up when we were talking about happiness, but it's so easy for us to go into that spiral of thoughts. But how do you suggest people like refrain from that type of uh, vocabulary? Yeah, no, it's it's hard. It's hard. I, I it's hard. It really yeah. is hard. <laughs> no, I'm like, no, it's hard. I mean, I, I want to say like, oh, just do this. No, it's it's really hard we all do it. We all, the grass is always greener on the other side. We, we base our 
desire for fulfillment on external things. And most of the time, 90% of the time that thing gets here and you're still not fulfilled. You're still not going to feel that elusive happiness. The good news is you can feel that right now. You can feel the fullness of that happiness, that joy, that sense of, of completion right now. If you can feel it, if you, you know how some people say, if you can see it, you can be it. Mm -hmm. I, I always say, if you can feel it, you can manifest it. There you like go. if you can yeah. feel it, you can bring it into fruition. If you can feel it within yourself now, you can, you can create the external experience also. So I'm a big, and, and if anything, you're just creating a good sense of, you know, uh, physiological, uh, oxytocin, feel good hormones for your body, which is great. You know, um, there's nothing, there's nothing that exists outside of you that is going to create a deep sense of completion. If, if the whole process of self love and self healing journey is to create that sense of completion and, and connection within yourself now, not when I get my partner, when I get the love of my life, when I get the career, when I write a book, when I, whatever, because it's, it's elusive. It's, it's never ending. It's going to, yes. one thing's going to replace the next and the next and the next. There's this thing that happened with, with me and Tori uh, a lot. And, and it happened for many, many years until he finally pointed it out. I did this thing where in my mind, I would create this scenario. And then once it would happen, I would build it up so much in my mind that by the time it came to fruition, I was, I was disillusioned and disappointed every mm. single time. And he brought it up to me one time, I don't know, like maybe 10 years ago. Um, and he said, do you realize that you're always disappointed? And it made me really sad at first. I felt a little bit like, that's so rude. Like, why would you say that to the person that you love? Like, that's so mean. Um, but I took it, I took it in that way. He didn't mean it in that way. Hmm. And when we had, we had more time, he sat down and he explained, he said, no, what I was trying to point out is the fact that in your brain, you make up these, it could be anything like going on a trip or on a date, you know, oh, I'm so, I'm, lo I'm so looking forward to going on this date to eating at a restaurant and going to watch a movie or whatever. And it would happen. And then I would just be like, uh, that was not how it was in my mind. In my mind, I'm, I've always been such an imaginative person. It always feels so much better to have the experience in my mind than make it happen. And so I started to exper experiment a little bit. And the experiment was, I'm not going to build up this next thing that I'm really looking forward to. I'm just going to let it, let it be what it is. And I realized that it was so much more fun for me to have this experience without having any attachment to the results. And not in a sort of like, you know, a uh, disassociative way where I'm like, oh, don't attach and be like the Buddha. I'm like genuinely, okay, I have no expectation. And at first I had to be a little bit cut off, like zero expectation, whatever happens, happens. It is what it is. But I noticed that I would just, I would feel more content and more fulfilled. So there's definitely something to that. And I started to realize, oh, every single time I've built something up in my brain, I am disappointed because in my brain, it's like I've concocted this Scorsese type film that mm -hmm. everything was going to go so perfectly and everybody was going to show up and raise their glass and it was going to be perfect and everybody's going to have a good time. And, but it's that desire for perfection and control, right? That we have, that we want things to be a certain way or we're not going to be happy. And if I can have that experience, I've already had that experience in my brain and it already made me feel good. So it's almost like I'm just addicted to that drug, right? Of like, ooh, the feel good hormone, right? So then by the time it happens in real life, I'm, it's going to be really hard to live up to that. That's what we do in relationships all the time. Okay. We have certain expectations in our brain. And then by the time our partner shows up, we already have all this resentment and, disconnection because in our brain it didn't happen exactly the way we wanted to and that's not fair you know
Yeah. Oh, it's so important to pull out. And I know who relates to this. I mean, <laughs> who has done this before? I actually, my, my boyfriend pointed that out on Valentine's day of my expectation and, and he had a surprise and yeah, anyways, I think anybody could relate to this, to be honest. And that's actually the kind of interesting thing to bring up because when you think about manifestation, they always say, visualize what you desire, step into that experience. Like you're there. And so how do we discern which one to do and what not to do because expectations will always like yeah. lead always not be good like we'll we'll always be short of those expectations yes. so yeah how do we how do we discern which one to visualize and which one? Yeah, not? no, I think it's, it's about balance. I mean, the whole, the, the practice of yoga is to cultivate more discernment, to mm. know when to do and when not to do and to discern, to know when enough is enough and it's too much. And it's, it's the balance. I think it really just, it requires an acute awareness to a, a balancing act. I want to visualize and manifest this dream and not but or if and i also want to be open to whatever happens yeah open to the gifts to flow in yeah, yeah. that actually that's part of the like if somebody were the, it, everybody describes manifestation a little differently and one of the things that's often said is once you have this desire step into it become it and all these things but then release your attachment to how it shows up Absolutely. That's and the, the only way we could, we could do that through meditation and yoga and really quiet or going for quiet walks, like is actually like releasing those thoughts, right. And being able to like, just surrender. <laughs> yeah, no, I love it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, just to wrap things up, cause there's so much goodness and I know your book, it, it, I are already have dug into it. There's so much. So you are radically loved. I know I saw that you were sharing on your stories that you went to uh, graffiti, uh, some of your book art in yeah. Los Angeles. And I love, I love it because we need more positivity surrounding us and on these streets in Los Angeles. So it was so beautiful to see that, but uh, two questions. So I always have my closing question, but before I ask that, what are you, uh, what's next for you? And what do you feel you are struggling with right now? Uh, finding out what's next, <laughs> like two and one, that's, that's yeah. the answer to both questions. <laughs> hey, that that's seriously an answer. Um, to yeah, no, I, I think, uh, I think what's next is, uh, hopefully book number two. Um, but we'll see how this book goes. I think depending on how well this book goes will determine whether I do another book or not. So um, if anybody out there is curious or interested, please go buy it. Yes, uh, yes. it will be in the show notes, everybody. Yes. So please do. It's a beautiful, I love the cover, by the way. The cover is so attractive and it's just, it kind of calls to you and there's so much goodness in this. And I think this book is so important. And I think the topic, I love talking about self-love because I think it's the foundation of creating and attracting anything you want in love is really embodying that love for ourselves. And then everybody seeks love. And so the only way for that to come to us is we need to be an example of that. We need to be love. We need to embody that love. So self-love is the most important topic really. But as we talked about, there's so many components of that. It's not one thing it's, it's so much more, it's respect, it's acceptance, it's care, it's honesty, it's integrity, oh. it's boundaries, it's everything. Preach, oh my gosh. <laughs> no, it's like, it's, it's just such a, a deep subject, right? It, it needs to go far and wide. So everybody grab the book that obviously will be in the show notes. And then of course, my final question, I always ask people this, and I love that everybody gives such a vast different answer for this. So if you were to leave one piece of advice that you feel anybody needs to hear right now, it could be really anything, but anything you feel is tugging on your heart that you feel you need to share with the world, what would it be? Uh, just remember who you are. Always remember who you are. That, that deep essence that is you, that lives within you, that is unstruck by anything or anyone, any event. It's beyond the surface it's way past the superficial layer of this external self it's that part of you that is unaffected and connected to everything that you are 
Absolutely beautifully said. And yes to all that. Absolutely. I think that's our journey in life is how do we return home yes. to ourselves every day in every practice. Right. And, and so of course you, you share so many tools and how to really get to that radical self-love by all the different chapters you share of what that even looks like. So Rosie, this has been such an honor. Thank you for all the goodness you do in the world and for birthing your baby book and being it so, so many more people could learn about this and all that your teachings and your life journey that is giving, given you the wisdom to share this with the world. And of course, everybody go check out her podcast, Radically Loved and uh, yeah, and follow her. I actually wanted to ask, well, I could ask you personally, but I, I want to take yoga right now. <laughs> and so I'm wondering, are you doing live classes right now? I'm not doing any live classes right now, but I do have, I mean, classes online. I, I, I have a like huge catalog of classes, uh, in two different places. Well, actually the biggest one is on Wanderlust. So if you That's go to Wanderlust TV, there's like a, you can find me. I'm one of like the featured teachers and there's like a ton of classes. There's courses you can take. And also uh, I have a handful of classes on bar three. So if you're into like Pilates and stuff, there's like pl bar three is incredible. Um, I, I do have two international retreats planned this year. One is in Mexico in July and the other is in Italy at the end of August. So if you do want to practice in person on a retreat, setting, uh, you can, I can send you the info for that. Amazing. Okay. Well, I'll plug up all your goodies. And of course, where everybody could find you will be in the show notes. So thank you again for your precious time on your book launch day, especially. And yeah, you're such a blessing. Thank you thank for your you. sharing your Thanks, life with Erica. us.